Yes. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Shall Happy we seek Sabbath, the, right? Happy, thank you, Tom. Shall we seek the Lord's guidance as we open his word for this morning? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you that we can again come together. Open your word, study together, and seek your guidance. Be with us as we as we do this today. Help us so that we may understand that which you have left and you have provided for us at this time. There are many examples in your scripture that we do not understand. So we seek you. We seek you to guide us. We seek you to tell us and show us that which we need to know for this time. I ask your blessing, Father, on everyone that's attending this study this morning. And for those that will attend the study, watching it by video. Help us now, direct us so that all that is done may bring glory to your name. Help us so that we may glorify your name in all that we do. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're going to touch back on a document that we, we touched on last week. We went through quite a bit of the definition of a concubine. Now, what do we recall about this definition of concubine? Why is this important and why are we being shown this in scripture? Well, we are looking at this because of uh, uh, what happens in, in Judges. At near the end of Judges, so dealing with uh, the concubine. So I can't remember beyond that. Okay. Well, to ask a very simple question, was it in God's providence that men should have more than one wife? No. Was it in God's providence that wives should have more than one husband? No. Nope. Here we deal with a situation where man is setting himself above God and above God's law. So, as we were going through this, we are showing that David had seven, actually eight wives and 10 concubines. We know that Solomon had multiple wives. I mean, 700 wives and 300 concubines. So he had a thousand women to whom he was associated. Hmm. Rehoboam, his son had 18 wives and 60 concubines. All the way through this, we are being given examples of really what we should not be doing. Hmm. Now, in scripture, we started here with references from Judges. And we're going to get into part of this today, where in Judges 19, it is stated, and his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto his, her father's house in Bethlehem, Judah. 
and was there for four whole months. But we're going to have some things to consider about this verse. We can see that Saul, King Saul, had a concubine. We can see, of course, that David had concubines, and so did Solomon. This was not according to God's law. Now, when we get into concubines, plural, we find that Abraham had concubines. He had two, correct? Mm -hmm. So unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward and unto the east country. Abraham had concubines. Did Isaac have concubines? No. Correct. I can't think of it. Yeah, I think no. so. Did Jacob have concubines? Not that I'm aware of. So all four of the women he was married to, they were all four wives, right? No, there was two handmaids. And they, of course, they're the two handmaids, but all of them were treated as wives. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are told in 2 Samuel 5, that David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron, and there was yet sons and daughters born unto David. Now, all of these situations are showing us that this was not a way that God wanted these things to be handled these men chose to act as they thought was best. Mm -hmm. I'll be providing this document for reference. I'll be sending it to Theodore. And I would be interested in any other thoughts that anyone might have on this particular subject. Okay. Now, what was really interesting to me when I went through all of these, I came to the end of, of this in looking at the different verses dealing with concubines. And there was one word that, that had popped up that I really was intrigued with, and that's the one that's on the screen now, Mizpah which is in the feminine and is defined as watchtower. Why is a watchtower important? The scope of trouble. Watchman. Why is a watchtower in the feminine gender important? Are you looking at the uh, feminine being the church as a watch watchtower? Okay, agreed. In the feminine being the church, it is something that is to give a word of warning, a sound of warning. Would you agree or disagree? Agree. Agree. Okay. Now we're going to find that mitzpah plays a role in what we're going to be studying. So keep this in mind. Now. Now. 
as we come back to Judges 18, we left off last week in Judges 18.21. We have a party of the tribe of Judah that claims himself to be a Levite. And this party from Judah is given an opportunity by a man named Micah. Micah is willing to pay him and provide him with clothing and provide for his daily sustenance. What does Micah mean? The one who is like God. No. No, it's not. Well, um, all right. So Micah. I don't know. Who is like? Okay, who is like, yes. Just not the God parts there. Correct. Yeah. So the question becomes, who is Micah representing at this time where Micah is willing to provide funds, clothes, and food for one of the tribe of Judah that claims to be of the Levites. Is he not setting himself up as an authority? And this priest from Judah, is he really a Levite if he is willing to worship a graven image, a molten image, and the gods of this man's house? Is he following God? No. So in Judges 18, 19, and they of the tribe of Dan said unto him, hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth and go with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for thee to be a priest under the house of one man or that thou be a priest under the tribe and a family in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. And he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went in the midst of the people. So they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle and the carriage before them. And when they were a good way from the house of Micah, from the house of who is like, the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house were gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. Now, of course, what is the meaning of the name Dan? Judge. So we have gone from the house of who is like to dealing with the children of judge. And they cried unto the children of Dan, and they turned their faces, and they said unto Micah, What aileth thee that thou comest with such a company? So they're having a problem. Why have these men come? Why are they here in Mount Ephraim? The Danites had been allotted territory much further south from here. But they were choosing not to go after their territory they wanted to go after a territory that someone else had already conquered 
How is this not like the church today? Is the church continuing to use Miller's rules? Is the church following in the steps of the pioneers? Is the movement in the majority following in the steps of the pioneers? These are the questions that we've been asking. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to kind of go over it, because you know, I was a little bit lost when we started because I couldn't remember things from a week ago. Sure. So, so we have this, this um, Judges 18, which we're studying. Right. And there is this person who's serving in the house of Micah as a Levite, but he's from the tribe of Judah. Right. Okay. And these Danites now are coming and they come to this house of Micah. Correct. And and they're looking to find land or something. They're trying to settle uh, where they're not supposed to be settling. Correct. Okay. Um, and then there's going to be this situation where they spy out the land and they come upon the graven image. There's the, this ephod, the teraphim, all these different things. And there's 600 men that were appointed to weapons of war, it talks about. Right. And so I'm just trying to get the background of this. So, um, so these are going to take, these are men of, uh, okay, these are children of Dan, these 600 men of war. So there's something I'm missing in this story. Should we go back over the, the first portion of the chapter? Well, well, yeah. So, okay. okay well, just, just can you give me a summary of exactly how you see what's happening? Because I'm not sure if I follow the story completely. Okay. Here is Micah. Yeah. As we looked at this in chapter 17, uh -huh. Micah had stolen money that his mother was going to use to give to a smelter to make gods. Right. Now, the premise that we're going to establish is that these chapters from 17 through 21 mm -hmm. of Judges are occurring at the early portion of the book of Judges, not really at the end of Judges. Yeah, then that's pretty clear that this is prior to, like this is shortly after Joshua dies. Right. Yeah. Now, to me it's shocking that this would happen so soon after the death of Joshua. Mm -hmm. Now, my question with this is can the application be made that we're dealing in this portion very similar to how the Millerite movement was reacting soon after the death of William Miller? Yeah, it's that period of time. So then trying to find this story here, the children of Dan coming in, to this story we're saying that this is a judge we have micah his name means who is like and and i can't get my mind around it to make the applications yet okay so so what's happening at the beginning of this chapter then what's the what's the issue that's what i don't understand i just don't even understand the literal story yet so okay now, of course, we are establishing that the various verses that begin in those days, there was no king in Israel. Mm -hmm. That links every one of these chapters together. Yes. Okay. Now we're told the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in, 
for unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. So who are they representing? I'm asking if the Danites are not representing the Millerites that became Laodicea. Okay. Okay, it's interesting. Keep going. Okay. Now, and the children of Dan sent of their family five men from their coasts, men of valor. It's telling us where these men came from, and they are spying out the land, very similar to what had occurred when Moses sent the 12 spies into Canaan, right? Mm -hmm. So we have five. Mm -hmm. I believe we established last week that these are not the wise virgins. These are the foolish virgins. Mm -hmm. So they're out spying. They come to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah and they stayed. They lodged in the house of Micah. Mm -hmm. So who is like? They're searching. They're asking questions. They've come because they have not had the backbone to take their own allotment. They're looking. How can we take someone else's? Yeah, so they're not, they're not overthrowing um, the Canaanites that are in their property. Right. All of them. Okay. Now, the question is, is this like the Millerites that chose not to continue following Miller's rules and started accepting the Protestant ways of teaching? Mm -hmm. Seems to be, they seem to be taking their course. Okay, thank you. Now, when they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite. How would they know this young man's voice? He would have been familiar to them. Mm -hmm. And they turned in thither, and they said unto him, Who brought thee hither? And what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? We have three questions that are being asked. And he said unto them, thus and thus, dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. Uh -huh. Was the Levite supposed to be for hire? No. So we have a man of Judah that claims to be a Levite that is now for hire. Is that not like what we're seeing going on as we study Millerite history and then look at our own history? Mm -hmm. And they said unto him, as counsel, we pray thee of God, that we may know whether our way, which we go, shall be prosperous. And the priest said unto them, go in peace before the Lord is your way wherein you go. Is this the way that a true priest would have responded no and we're given an example of that from first kings 22 so jehoshaphat said unto the king of israel inquire i pray thee at the word of the lord today then the king of israel gathered his prophets together about 400 men and said unto them 
Shall I go up against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hands of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord beside that we might inquire of him? Isaiah makes it very clear, and so does Hosea. Mm -hmm. Now, as we continue through this in background, <clears throat> the five men departed, came to Laish, and saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt careless after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure. And there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything. And they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any man. So these five Danites are opportunistic. Mm -hmm. Where are we going to find those that are giving a peace and safety message that don't really care about what's going on right now? Thinking of the five foolish. Yes. There, you know, had the tribe of Dan had even a portion of the faith that Caleb showed, they could have conquered the coast that they left to the Philistines. They could have conquered that which was allotted to them. But at their time, they are deciding that they're not going to put out the effort to use the faith to inquire of God, where are you to go? They're inquiring of man. Is this the path that we are to follow? No. And they came unto their brethren to Zorah and Eshtal, and their brethren said unto them, What say ye? And they said, Arise, that we may go up against them. For we've seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And are ye still? Be not slothful to go and to enter to possess the land. If this kind of word had been given among all of the 12 spies, would it not have been that the children of Israel would have conquered the land to begin with? Mm -hmm. We're given this as an example. The way that Father Miller laid out for study was given to him, I believe, by Gabriel. Mm -hmm. I believe that was given to Gabriel by Christ. I believe it was given by Christ from God. We are to study according to Miller's rules. Here, we have five foolish that have gone into a land where there's even more foolish than they. Because they note that we may go up against them. For we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. Be not slothful to go and to enter to possess the land. And when you go, you come to a people secure and to a large land, for God hath given it into your hands, a place where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. Now here we go with the 600 men girded with weapons of war. But what weapons were they using?
What weapons are we given? Are we not given the scripture and are we not given prayer? Mm -hmm. well, sword and shield. Yeah, Ephesians 6. Okay. But are we seeing those weapons being used here <clears throat> by the Danites? No. So where are their weapons coming from? Man. Exactly. Carnal. Yeah. And they went up and they pitched in Kirjath Jerem in Judah, where they called the place Mahahanan Dan to this day. Behold, it is behind Kirjath Jerem. Okay, right. What was that? I just remembered now the, the, the story. Okay. Thence now. Now, after they pitched here, they passed thence unto Mount Ephraim and came unto the house of Micah. Then answered the five men that went to spy out the country of Laish and said unto their brethren, do you know that there, there is in these houses an ephod and a teraphim and a graven image and a molten image? Now, therefore, consider what you do. What did the word of God say about items such as this? Is it not clear that we were to have no other God before the creator of the universe? Were not all of the tribes of the children of Israel instructed in this manner? Yeah, very clearly. So here is Micah choosing not to follow the word of God. Here are the Danites noting what Micah has. <clears throat> and they turned thitherward and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, even unto the house of Micah and asked him of peace. We went through this because we have the example with Joseph, and we have the example with David. The 600 men girded for war stood by the entering of the gate to the house of Micah. Does that mean that they're, they're battling with Micah? Does that place them in total opposition to those that they are finding in Mount Ephraim? Mm -hmm. And the five men that went to spy out the land went up and came in thither and took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priest stood in the entering of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed with weapons of war. Is there a symbolic representation to 601? the priest standing with the 600 men of war. Hmm. 
And these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image, the ephod, the teraphim, and the molten image. Then said the priest unto them, what do ye? And they said unto him, hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth and go with us. So in other words, to the priest, they're saying, be quiet, come with us. Be to us a father and a priest. It is better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man, or that thou be a priest unto the tribe and a family in Israel. This priest that was seeking compensation, seeking raiment, so seeking righteousness of man, and seeking for his daily bread, is now willing to trade that from Micah to going with Dan. What do we see here? Well, I mean, it's obviously religion for sale. Okay. If it's religion for sale, is this according to God's instruction? No. I'm still trying to place this story, though, as far as. Um, so we got. So who's Micah representing? The I would ask, what was that? The Protestants. I would ask if he's not representing those that are laid to see him. Okay. Because they have a counterfeit religious system. Right. Um, to me, you know, Micah would represent the Protestants, the house of Micah, the Protestants. And the Danites would be the Millerites who haven't inherited the land. That is, they didn't follow through with what God had directed them to do. They didn't finish the work. But now they're going to seek... They're going to, in a sense, go back to Protestantism, and but still try to establish themselves as as Adventists. So this would be the first day Adventists, the Millerites, who you know still tried to maintain Millerism, and and it and it became a lot of different groups. But, I mean, that's the way that I would look at the story. Okay, so let's take this application. Yeah. So if Micah is representing the Protestants. Right. And he has this, this false Levite working for him. Right. Right, which, is, which would represent the Protestants in their, um, their profession to be the Christians, but yet they have a counterfeit Christianity, which they have taken some of the trappings of Catholicism. So they've mixed truth and error. And they never fully, so these are the ones who failed the first test. The Danites are the ones who failed the second test. Right, but they're gonna go back to the Protestants that they came from. Okay. Okay, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, if, if we look at this as, as we have been looking at other situations, this would give us a, a specific set of premises to make the application that 
Micah is representing the Protestants, that Dan, the Danites, are representing those of the Millerites that did not wish to follow Miller's rules, because as this story continues, they choose to accept the graven image, the molten image, the teraphim and the ephod that they find in Micah's house. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were looking at these as different ways in which the Protestants today are differing from the movement today, mm -hmm. we would see that one would be Sunday sacredness. Yeah. One would be the state of the dead. One would be the understanding of um, what the gospel is. I mean, the, the point that many are, are within Protestantism today are trying to push is once saved, always saved. Mm hmm they don't wish to see anything that has to do with the courtyard, with the holy place, or with the most holy. They just believe that once you accept the name of Christ, that you're saved regardless. And you can continue doing exactly what you're doing right now, and you're still saved. Okay. Now, this story is setting us up for chapter 19, too. Correct. Which I think is the where the illustration becomes the most powerful. But, but you need this background in order to understand it. Exactly. Okay. So, so we can look at the players here. We can see who the Levite represents and then who his concubine would represent. Right. Okay. So this Levite, this priest, his heart is now glad. He takes the ephod, he takes the teraphim, he takes the graven image. And he went in the midst of the people. Is he Levite or is he Levin? Well, he's definitely not a Levite. So is he then Levin? Is he leavening all of the people mm -hmm. so they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle and the carriage before them now that's a little different from what we were what we were addressing before when it came to the amalekites and the situation with moses when Joshua had to battle the Amalekites. Because the weak, the infirm, the aged, the little ones were the those that the Amalekites attacked. So Judges 18.22, when they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men that were in the houses near to Micah were gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. And they, those that were in the houses near Micah's house, cried unto the children of Dan. And they turned their faces and said unto Micah, What aileth thee, that thou art gathered together? Why are you coming to us now? Why have you put together such a company uh -huh. to come to us? And Micah said, you have taken away the gods which I made and the priest, and you are gone away. And what have I more? What is this that you say unto me? What aileth thee? Why are you surprised 
at my outburst? What is causing you grief after what you've done to me? Is this then not the Protestants crying unto an unfaithful church? Why are you being so different from me? Yeah, this, this is um, the 1950s. Okay. I mean, what I see in this as we look through this is this story is going to bring us through, mil- through Adventist history. Yeah. Up until our time. A little surprising to look at it that way, isn't it? Yeah. But it makes sense when you go through this whole story. So as we continue. And the children of Dan said unto him, Let not thy voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows run upon thee, and thou lose thy life and the lives of thy household. The examples that are given in scripture about this, 2 Samuel 17, verses 7 and 8. And Hushai said unto Absalom, The counsel that Ahithophel hath given is not good at this time. For, said Hushai, thou knowest thy father and his men, that they be mighty men, that they be chafed in their minds as a bear robbed of her whelps in the field. And thy father is a man of war and will not lodge with the people. So what was the counsel that Ahithophel had given to Absalom that Hushai found so onerous? Ahithophel said unto Absalom in 2 Samuel 17, 1, Let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night. And I will come upon him when he is weary and weak-handed, and will make him afraid. And all the people that are with him shall flee, and I shall smite the king only. And I will bring back all the people unto thee. The man whom thou seekest is as if all returned, so that the people shall be in peace. And the saying pleased Absalom well and the elders of Israel. So Ahithophel was saying, Mm -hmm. let's go after David. Let's embarrass David. Well, yeah, and um, and then he's going to call Hushai for a second opinion. Right. So here we are. We're seeing the time of the abomination of questions on doctrine. Yeah. We're seeing the effects of what questions on doctrine is going to have within the church, but also with the Protestants. Mm Mm-hmm. And the children of Dan went their way. And when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his house. The lessons that were attempted to be taught were being set aside in 1957. the manner of Millerite's teaching and of that that Father Miller had presented were being set aside. 
And they took the things that Micah had made and the priest which he had and came unto Laish, unto a people that were at quiet and secure. And they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city with fire. They came with a message of war to a people that were quiet and secure, that were not willing to defend themselves. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Zidon and they had no business with any man. And it was in the valley that lieth by Beth Rehob. And they built a city and dwelt therein. And they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan, their father, who was born into Israel, howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan, the man of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. How do we view that captivity of the land? Is this not the Assyrians taking Israel captive? Okay. Yeah. When was that to have occurred? Well, 723, 721. Now, I'm looking at this right here as it occurring, let's say roughly BC 1406. Okay. So 700 years prior. Roughly, roughly, yes. So the children of Dan set up this graven image. And it remained until the day of the captivity of the land. There's an important situation here. Because the land is part of the covenant. So Dan was worshiping idols and graven images and giving up the covenant. Would you have a problem with that? Yeah. Now, there's quite a few verses that have gone along with this. When we're dealing in this situation, when we look at this regarding the city of Dan, Genesis 14, 14. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. So he pursued them unto Laish, which would have been in the northern portion of Israel. Now, as we're going to get into this further, Judges 20, verse 1. Then all of the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, from judge to the well of the oath, mm -hmm. from judge to the 2520, with the land of Gilead 
unto the Lord in Mitzpah. Unto the Lord in the watchtower. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. So what were they doing? Were they obeying what God had given them? Were they keeping the covenant that God had provided? They were showing externally and internally that they could not keep the covenant. Uh -huh. The king sets up a golden calf in Bethel, the house of God, and he places the other in judge. Uh -huh. What symbols do we see there? What can we say about this? Church and state. Yeah, church and state. What, what do we see, though, since this is supposed to be a representation of the church? What representation are we seeing when the civil authority connected with the church sets these up in Bethel and in Dan. Now, so what point of Adventist history would it be? Would this not be from 1919 to 1957? Okay. I don't know. Um, when did the church seek the power of the state? About 1932. Okay. Where was the church incorporated? I don't know. Anybody else? Was it Washington, D.C.? or Had to be under that of a state. You cannot incorporate under a district. Oh, okay. It comes as a shock to many to realize that the church was incorporated under the laws of the state of Maryland. Why is that difficult for the Seventh-day Adventist church to incorporate under the laws of the state of Maryland? When you incorporate, you're incorporating under the laws of a specific state and under their constitution. Yeah. The constitution of the state of Maryland is very specific. When 
an entity is incorporated according to their laws, they will agree that Sunday is the Sabbath and Sunday is to be kept holy. Hmm. So that's church and state though too. It is. But it's also shocking that legally those in the Seventh-day Adventist church knew this at the time that they incorporated the church according to the laws of Maryland. Okay, so yeah, this seems to be the case. Huh. So, so why did they do that? I wasn't there. <laughs> I've had people in the past that said, well, you know, they, they probably incorporated according to the laws of Michigan, because that's where Battle Creek was. Yeah. But they didn't. They chose Maryland. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, because I'm looking at the Warburg Adventist Church website. Okay. And uh, it says, this site is created and controlled under the laws of the state of Maryland, which shall be given, which shall be the law giving effect to an interpretation of all terms and conditions here under. It shows all the copyright things of the Adventist Church. Uh, they own the copyright for uh, the General Conference Corporation of Seventh day Adventists, uh, Conference of Seventh day Adventists, Seventh day Adventist, and also Adventist, as well as numerous other trademarks. I don't know how you could uh, copyright the name Adventist. They found a way. Because there's other groups that are Adventist groups. Well, I, I found it very interesting as we get a little further into this study. Yeah. That the Adventist church, the Seventh Day Adventist church right now, mm -hmm. does not wish to allow those in the movement the right to claim to be Adventist, but they are willing to allow the name, the term Adventist to be used by others. Um, quite honestly, there, there's a movie that was out not that long ago that was called Seventh Gay Adventist mm -hmm. because the church has allowed churches to be funded and founded in California specifically for those that wish to continue in the homosexual lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Now, there is, I mean, it is very specific in the Constitution of Maryland that those that are so incorporated must agree that Sunday is the Sabbath, that Sunday is the day of worship, and that they are to keep that day of worship. So when we're, when we're so worried about this with the Sunday law, it comes as a shock to many that the church has already agreed under their bylaws and under their incorporation that they will keep Sunday. Now, as we come here, Judges 18.31, and they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. When was the house of God in Shiloh? Um, well, until David took the ark from Shiloh to Jerusalem. Um, wasn't the house of God in Shiloh until the death of Eli? Um, 
because the ark was taken by the Philistines at that point. Yeah, the ark was captured. Um, okay, you could be right. Um, now, um, just going back to um, Judges uh, 18, verse 30. Sure. where it talks about the children of dad dan set up the graven image and jonathan the son of gershom the son of manasseh he and his sons were priests to the tribe of dan until the day of the captivity of the land um it is possible that that could be the captivity of the ark just um uh, why would it be so noted twice I don't know. It's hard I to see. I, I don't see this as a double. Okay. That's that's a point that I'm presenting. And it's, I'm just word, it's just the word. It's just the word haretz and haran for ark can be can look very similar. Right. Uh, one's a vav and one's a tzadi, and and just. The final Saudi, which is uh, a little bit different, so it could have been mistaken. I don't know. It's just, it's just. It seems to me that this is talking about um, uh, this worship. But uh, anyway, I just don't know what the captivity of the land would have to do with the captivity of the ark. Would make more sense, but that's just just an observation. Okay. I'm just asking the question. <clears throat> Yeah. Here is here's the situation with the children of Dan. They're taking over an area that someone else had already conquered. Yeah. They're choosing to follow molten and graven images. That means that they are not adhering to God's covenant. So if this is the case, then is God not taking the promised land away when the land is then brought captive? Okay. And then we have the situation with the ark, because the ark was viewed as being integral with the house of God, was it not? Mm -hmm. So when the ark was captured by the Philistines, you have this, the house of God that has been in Shiloh. When the ark is returned, is the ark returned to Shiloh? I believe scripture will show that it was not. Okay. Okay. So, now we get into a chapter that is difficult for many. The chapter headings here are Levite of Mount Ephraim goeth to Bethlehem to fetch home his concubine, and on his return cometh to Gibeah in the evening. An old man entertaineth him. The men of the city beset the house with vile intent to prevent which the man yieldeth up his concubine, who is abused by them to death. He divideth her into twelve parts, 
which he sendeth to the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the alternate reading of Judges 19.1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a woman, a concubine, out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, we've identified that a concubine is not a primary wife, correct? Mm -hmm. We have identified that symbolically a woman represents the church or a church. Now, if this man has taken a concubine, does that also not infer that he's already married? I would say probably. Okay. So you have a woman, a concubine, or a wife, a concubine, that this man has taken out of Bethlehem, Judah. Where was, in, in the previous two chapters, where was this Levite, this supposed Levite, supposed to be from? Was he not from Bethlehem? Mm -hmm. Of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. So is it possible that this certain Levite is the same Levite that we have been addressing in chapters 17 and 18? It's definitely possible. I would think it's the same one. Okay. I would agree. Now. Next verse. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house in Bethlehem, Judah, and was there. And we have two different ways that this is to be looked at. It says first four whole months. The alternate reading says a year and four months. And the alternate Hebrew says days four months. Now, if this is a year and four months, are we talking 16 or 17 months? Depending on, on what calendar we're looking at. Um. Okay, you're saying that, okay. Explain again about the year and four months. Okay. Using the 1769 Bible, the alternate reading says that this could be translated a year and four months. And the alternate Hebrew says days, four months. Yeah, I don't know how see how it could be translated as a year and four months. Okay. Because it really says four months of days. Okay. So I'm not sure their alternate really makes sense. It definitely doesn't say year anywhere here. Okay. Uh, me reading from one of the translators notes in the Bible I've got, it gives the two options, four whole yeah. months or a year and four months. Yeah, yeah, I have the same thing in my margin as well, but it doesn't say that in Hebrew. I'm not, I'm not sure of that expression. I, I don't, because I mean, it literally says days, four months, doesn't say anything about years, unless they're arguing this is some kind of expression, but. Okay. Anyway, I'm just trying to establish the basis for what they're doing. 
Okay. So if if we were to have this as being four months, approximately how many days would we have in that four month period? Well, four months is 160 prophet, prophetic days. Or not, uh, pardon me, 120. Okay. Right. So 60 plus 60 or 30 times four. Prophetic, right. Yeah. We could be as few in that time period as 118 days. We could also be 119. We could be 120. Mm -hmm. Depending on how we look at the literal on that. Yeah. So she's away from him for a while. Mm -hmm. And her husband arose and went after her to speak to her heart and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses. And she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. Now, here he is noted as the woman's husband. We have stated prophetically, biblically, that the symbol of the woman is a church. This Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, has come having his servant with him and a couple of asses. Does that mean that he is bringing twice the message of Islam that we saw with Balaam? Here is this Levite of Judah who has served an idolatrous people, has served a people that are seeking after their own, not seeking after God. He is now coming to his concubine, his lesser wife. What is the admonition that is given to the Levites in, from the book of Malachi? Well, it's about a, the, the message in the book of Malachi to the Levites specifically? Yeah. Specifically. Well, there's lots of things in there. I mean, robbing God, that they're going to be cleansed, refined. He rebukes them because of the, the covenant that they broke, that they haven't kept the covenant, which is probably what you're focusing on. Chapter two. I'm focusing part on that, yes. Yeah. Is it not clear they have abandoned the wife of their youth? Yes. Did we not make the application that the wife of their youth was Miller's rules? Mm -hmm. So here we have this Levite. 
he has gone to Bethlehem to the house of the father of his concubine. He has taken his servant with him and a couple of asses. He has brought, she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. He had not met his daughter's husband. That says quite a bit, doesn't it? Because in a wedding, do not the families come together to get to know one another, mm -hmm. to celebrate the wedding. So here is the father. He's now rejoicing to meet his daughter's husband. Okay, so we have a message to about a Levite, like last night we studied uh, number 16. Right. And this was about the Levites as well. Right. And Malachi's a message to the Levites. And, and so the Levites are Seventh-day Adventists. Okay. That have... I mean, there is basically a call to the Levites from God. There's a huge call. Because they have a responsibility in preparing God's church and preparing the world. Because they have to give this, the message. They have to stand, withstand the Sunday law test and give the loud cry to the world. They're going to fulfill the purposes of Israel. Okay. But here again, just like with the situation with Balaam, we are being given an example of the Levite having a servant and a couple of asses mm -hmm. to come to his concubine. Right? Yeah. So Islam is playing into this. I found it interesting that the additional reference that was given takes us back to Genesis 34, verse 3. And it speaks this way. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel. And he spake kindly unto the damsel. So they're showing this from the book of Judges that this Levite is speaking friendly or spoke to the heart of his concubine, just as this son of the world spoke kindly to Dinah. Uh -huh. Now the next verse, Judges 19.4. And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him, and he abode with him three days. Mm -hmm. So they did eat and drink and lodge there. Is not the statement, father-in-law, the damsel's father, is this not a doubling? Mm -hmm. Is this not then a return to this, the message of the second angel? And it came to pass on the fourth day, when they arose early in the morning, that he rose up to depart, and the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go on your way. The alternate reading doesn't say comfort, it says strengthen. And the marginal reading takes us back to Genesis 18. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. 
after that ye shall pass on for therefore are ye come to your servant and they said so do as thou hast said and we know this is abraham and sarah mm -hmm. we know this is where the prediction is going to be made of the birth of isaac mm -hmm. So the father-in-law says to the son-in-law, strengthen thine heart, have a meal with me. And they sat down and they did eat and drink both of them together. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night and let thine heart be merry. And when the man rose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him. Therefore, he lodged there again. So how, how long are we talking about? We passed the three days. We passed the fourth day. Are we not into the fifth? What are we seeing in this portion? And he arose early on the fifth day to depart. And the damsel's father said, comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And they tarried till the day declined, and they did eat both of them. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant Three people, uh -huh. the fourth being his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold, now the day draweth toward evening. I pray you tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to an end. Lodge here, that thine heart may be merry, and tomorrow get you early on your way, that thou mayest go home or go to thy tent. Uh -huh. But the man would not tarry that night, but he arose up and departed and came over against Jabus, which is Jerusalem. And there were with him two asses saddled. His concubine also was with him. We have the man, we have his servant, we have the concubine, and we have two asses. Mm -hmm. And when they were by Jebus, the day was far spent. And the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, let us turn into this city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. Why was the city of the Jebusites not considered to be of the children of Israel? When was that? What do you mean, when was it? That when when Jerusalem became one of the cities of Israel? Well, do we not do we not find in the book of Joshua and also following in Judges that there was a time when the Jebusites were in charge of Jerusalem and it was quite mm -hmm. a while before it was taken. It was taken by by David. David's the one who took it. So they lived in the midst of mm -hmm. the land of the children of Israel for a long time. Yeah. 
over 400 years. Possibly 450 years. Yeah, so, well, yeah, quite a while anyway. Okay. <clears throat> and he said unto his servant, come, let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night in Gibeah or in Ramah. What is important about Ramah? Is this not where Samuel had his home? Mm -hmm. Is this not where he was teaching the school of the prophets? And it was also where Rachel was weeping for her children. Okay. But my... The, the difference that I'm trying to draw here, Rama, if this is where Samuel was teaching of the school of the prophets, would have been an example of those that are studying. Gibeah would have been more like those of the world. And they passed on and they went their way and the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongeth to Benjamin. And they turned aside thither to go in and to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat him down in a street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house to lodging. So if we look at this just a little different, we have two verses, Matthew 25, 43 and Hebrews 13, 2. As the savior stated, I was a stranger and you took me not in, naked and you clothed me not, sick and in prison and you visited me not. So here is this Levite of Judah with his concubine, with his servant, with two asses, and no one was offering to take them in. Hebrews 13, 2. Be, forget, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So he's come into Gibeah. He's not going to go on to Ramah. And behold, there came an old man from his work out in the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim. And he so sojourned in Gibeah, but the men of the place were Benjamites. So this Levite of Judah comes into a city of the Benjamites and an old man who was of Mount Ephraim comes into the town as well. What are we seeing here? Is this not this Levite of Judah is now recognizing someone that he would have known 
from Mount Ephraim? Yeah, seems that way. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city. And the old man said, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? And he said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From thence am I. And I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord. There is no man that receiveth me to house. Receiveth or gathereth. Here, the reference came back to Judges 19.15. Yet there is both straw and provender for our asses, and there is bread and wine also for me, and for thy handmaid, and for the young man which is with thy servants. There is no want of anything. And the old man said, Peace be with thee. Howsoever let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. Where have we heard this comment before? Lodge not in the street. Lot. Lot, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Lot says that to the angels. Mm -hmm. The old man says, peace be with thee. Who else would say, peace be unto you? Jesus. Christ, Lord. Okay. So, we are told, lodge not in the street. And the example there that is given, of course, as was just stated, Genesis 19.1 and 19.2. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn, and I pray thee, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. We assume we are going to be safe in this city because it is the city of the Benjamites. We assume that we are among brethren. Here in Genesis 19, they were among those of Sodom and Lot is offering his house. So he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses, and he washed their feet and did eat and drink. So he accepted the old man's invitation, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, be set the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. It's interesting. They called for the Levite from Judah, they did not call for his assistant. Why? Hmm. Hmm. 
Why did they call not for the servant? Why didn't they call for both of the men? Why did they call for just one? What can we draw from this? Could he have been a gay <clears throat> priest? All right. What evidence would you would you attach to that? Mm -hmm. Well, my computer had crashed, but I did manage to connect my phone for a while. I heard you mention seventh gay Adventists. So I was wondering whether this had any bearing on that. I mean, there's so much perversion in the church right now. So nothing surprises me anymore. I agree. There is a lot of perversion in the church. Are we seeing perversion within the movement as well? Did we not see this with Parminder and Tess? Especially when Parminder is attempting to address teaching with parables. Yes, and I do remember him saying about the Greeks, I think it was Sparta. And I thought this was really strange when he said it was good that the man, the army loved, loved one another. And I thought, he's talking about homosexuality. And I was wondering why he would even think that that was a good thing. So here we have a parallel with what we see in Genesis 19 with Lot. But we also have a parallel with the story of Balaam riding his ass. How many servants did Balaam take with him? Did he not take two servants? Mm -hmm. I think so. How many asses did Balaam take with him? Are we not? We're only really told about one, aren't we? Is it just one with Balaam? Yeah. Okay. The one that spoke to him. Yeah. So here this Levite is. He's got one servant, but two asses. So we have double the import with Islam. but only half the servant. The parallel with Lot is we have two angels and Lot steps out and says, nay, brothers, let, do not this folly. Here, the man, the master of the house went out unto them and said unto them, nay, brethren, nay, I pray you, do not do so wickedly, seeing that this man is come into mine house. Do not this folly. Yet when you're looking at this, when you're, you're going through the verse, is it folly or is it wickedness that is being shown? And I believe looking at this, comparing verse by verse, that we would see that this folly is accounted as wickedness. According to the laws that Moses gave to the children of Israel, what was to occur for those men that lay with men as they would women or women that lay with women? Were they not to be stoned? Mm -hmm. 
here is this city in the midst of Benjamin, in the midst of the allotted territory of Benjamin. that has a fairly direct homosexual element. Was this according to the laws that God had given? Had the children of Israel learned nothing from the example of Sodom and Gomorrah? Had the children of Benjamin become so jaded that they had learned nothing from this? How much of this is like us today? When we go through this, we are also given the example of 2 Samuel 13.10. And Ammon said unto Tamar, bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber for Ammon, her brother. And when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, come lie with me, my sister. And she answered, nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not do this folly. Do not do this wickedness. We're given the same admonition in Genesis 19. Do not do so wickedly. So, as I was reading through this, as I had been studying this and being led to study this, it was interesting to me in this comparison because one of the points that comes out very in 2 Samuel 13 was that Tamar, David's daughter, was dressed how? Was she not dressed as the other virgin daughters of the king were dressed. And yes, it, she was. And later after the break, she tore her purse, whatever it was, clothing in grief. Okay, but what does it say about her clothing at that time? Well, it designated her, her as a virgin. But what does it say about the clothing itself? I believe when you search, you will find that it is brightly colored, of many colors. Like Joseph's. Like Joseph's is right. Is this not identifying a pure church? She then weeps after the situation with Ammon, Amnon and tears her clothing. And I believe she covers her head in ashes. She recognizes the sin. She recognizes the fact that this is not 
what is to occur. But in the situation that we're dealing with here in the book of Judges, neither party, neither the Levite nor the people banging on the door are willing to recognize that this is not in keeping with God's order. This is not in keeping with his covenant. As the old man spoke, behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you, but unto this man do not do so vile a thing this matter of following. Should this man, the owner of the house, have given this kind of an offer of his daughter and the concubine? But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her and abused her all the night until morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. Depending on how we look at this, it was either the third watch or the fourth watch. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. This story is being given for our admonition today. What can we take from this in relation to what is happening currently? How do we approach this? And this is not an easy study. It's not an easy one to present. But it's something... I would that say... <clears throat> Sorry, Dwight, you can't make bargains with those who want to ruin you. Okay. The woman is being offered. Those that are beating on the door take the concubine and they abuse her. They let her go before it's light. They are only willing to do this while it is dark. They don't want their activity to be seen in the light. What are we being told about the Sunday law of and from the spirit of prophecy? Is it not? Uh, it's, occur it's occurring in darkness, it's occurring by stealth. 
So what's happening here? Is this not occurring by darkness? Yes. So if this is occurring by darkness, if this abuse is occurring by darkness, how are we going to be able to prepare ourselves? Because we can't be like the Levite from Judah. We cannot just give up that which we are saying, I will protect. We can't be like the old man that agrees to give up his daughter. We don't want to be like those that are banging on the door. I mean, this, this is not the same banging on the door that we see in the Song of Songs or that we see in the book of Revelation. This is not, behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is not the beloved that was out in the rain, banging on the door, waiting for entrance. How else can we compare this? How else can we look at this? Because this is an antithesis to those two examples. I'm thinking that because the church has sold herself to the world and worldly standards and was incorporated in Mary land, that she's pretty well sold herself to the papacy anyway. So the Lord is just washing his hands of her and saying, have at it. You want the Pope, you want the devil as your ruler, then let everything that's polluting you take control of you. I'm done. Okay. We only have a couple of minutes left before the, I believe it's the U.S. group this week. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're at a point that we're going to be returning to this next week. We're at a point of consideration because there's activity and a lot of it that is soon to occur. Consider what is in this chapter. Look for yourselves. Let when we come back to this, let us consider what we can see and the other examples that we can draw from this. I have been amazed, especially with the asses in this portion, because we know that this has a, a reference for Islam. But why the two asses here and only one in the situation with Balaam? Mm. So shall we close with prayer? Father in heaven, this story is here for our admonition so that we may avoid the issues that have occurred in the past, that we may learn from them and learn to trust more in you. Help us now, guide us through this day. Please be with us, each one. 
direct us as we study. Help us to rely upon you, upon what Father Miller has given us, and upon your scripture. May your will be done. May we come into unity. May we come to set aside these sins that are holding us back from receiving the outpouring of your spirit. Help us and guide us so that we may truly be prepared for that which you would have us to do. For this we thank you and for this we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.